Welcome to chapter 17 and things fall apart. In chapter 16 we saw the um, colonists, the white missionaries, come into Mbanta and start spreading their religion there as well as Umuafia and the villagers don't seem very worried. Um, instead of driving them away with violence like a Congo wants to do, instead they make these jokes and they kind of laugh at them and they don't see them as a threat at all. So in chapter 17, let's see what these missionaries are up to now. The missionaries spent their first four or five nights in the marketplace and went into the village in the morning to preach the gospel. They asked who the king of the village was, but the villagers told them that there was no king. We have men of high title, and the chief priests and the elders, they said. It was not very easy getting the men of high title and the elders together after the excitement of the first day. But the missionaries persevered, and in the end they were received by the rulers of Imbanta. They asked for a plot of land to build their church. Every clan and village had its evil forest. In it were buried all those who died of the really evil diseases like leprosy and smallpox. It was also the dumping ground for the potent fetishes of great medicine men when they died. An evil forest was, therefore, alive with sinister forces and powers of darkness. It was such a forest that the rulers of Imbanta gave to the missionaries. They did not really want them in their clan, and so they made them that offer which nobody in his right senses would accept. So they're like, oh, we really don't want these missionaries here, but we don't want to seem rude or inhospitable, so let's give them this offer of the evil forest, and hopefully they'll say, you know what, no thanks, we don't want to be in the evil forest, that's too scary for us. They want a piece of land to build their shrine, said Uchendu to his peers when they consulted among themselves. We shall give them a piece of land. He paused and there was a murmur of surprise and disagreement. Let us give them a portion of the evil forest. They boast about victory over death. Let us give them a real battlefield in which to show their victory. They laughed and agreed and sent for the missionaries whom they had asked to leave them for a while so they might whisper together. They offered them as much of the evil forest as they cared to take, and to their great amazement the missionaries thanked them and burst into song. They do not understand, said some of the elders, but they will understand when they go to their plot of land tomorrow morning, and they dispersed. So you can see from what the elders are saying here that they expect that the evil forest is going to treat these people poorly, that spirits and dark powers are going to come up and kind of run these missionaries off. The next morning the crazy men actually began to clear a part of the forest and to build their house. The inhabitants of Imbanta expected them all to be dead within four days. The first day passed, and the second, and third, and fourth, and none of them died. Everyone was puzzled. And then it became known that the white man's fetish had unbelievable power. It was said that he wore glasses on his eyes so that he could see and talk to evil spirits. Not long after, he won his first three converts. So instead of being scared away, these missionaries are growing in strength because the evil forest hasn't you know, risen up and devoured these people, people are starting to think, whoa, maybe there is something to this new religion. And they see this man wearing glasses as having some special power to communicate with these evil spirits. And so instead of these people, you know, abandoning their church, the church starts to gain strength. Although Nawoye had been attracted to the new faith from the very first day, he kept it a secret. He dared not go too near the missionaries for fear of his father. But whenever they came to preach in the open marketplace or the village playground, Nwoye was there, and he was already beginning to know some of the simple stories they told. We have now built a church, said Mr. Kiaga, the interpreter, who was now in charge of the infant congregation. The white man had gone back to Umuafia where he built his headquarters, and from where he paid regular visits to Mr. Kiaga's congregation at Imbanta. So this white guy, this missionary, has a home base in Umuafia, and from there he travels to the surrounding villages, establishing the church and making sure that they keep it going. We have now built a church, said Mr. Kiaga, and we want 
you all to come in every seventh day to worship the true God. On the following Sunday, Nooye passed and repassed the little red earth and thatch building without summoning enough courage to enter. Now we have a Sunday here. Before we had awful day and Eke day and all these Ebo days. All of a sudden, with the arrival of the missionary, we have a Sunday. That's showing you this hegemonic invasion. They're, they're changing the culture of the Igbo people. He heard the voice of singing, and although it came from a handful of men, it was loud and confident. Their church stood on a circular clearing that looked like the open mouth of the evil forest. Was it waiting to snap its teeth together? After passing and repassing by the church, Nwoye returned home. It was well known among the people of Mbanta that their gods and ancestors were sometimes long-suffering and would deliberately allow a man to go on defying them. But even in such cases, they set their limit at seven market weeks, or twenty-eight days. Beyond that limit, no man was suffered to go. And so excitement mounted in the village as the seventh week approached since the impudent missionaries built their church in the evil forest. The villagers were so certain about the doom that awaited these men that one or two converts thought it wise to suspend their allegiance to the new faith. At last the day came by which all the missionaries should have died. But they were still alive, building a new red earth and thatch house for their teacher, Mr. Kiaga. That week they won a handful more converts, and for the first time they had a woman. Her name was Ineka the wife of Amadi, who was a prosperous farmer. She was very heavy with child. So, instead of all these people dying after the seventh week, they're thriving. In fact, they're building this house for their teacher, Mr. Kiaga. And more people start to say, Ah, there must be something in this new religion. I should be a part of this. And now they get a woman. Ineka had had four previous pregnancies and childbirths, but each time she had borne twins, and they had been immediately thrown away. Her husband and his family were already becoming highly critical of such a woman and were not unduly perturbed when they found she had fled to join the Christians. It was a good riddance. So, this Ineka, this woman that has joined the church, she gives birth to twins. And people are starting to say, eh, something's wrong with Ineka. She keeps giving birth to these evil twins. And so when she leaves to join the church, they say, no big deal. We don't care. Let her go. But this is a problem. Because now they think that some people in their clan are expendable. And so instead of having the strength of numbers that they had before, their numbers are starting to dwindle because more and more people are, are joining this church. One morning, Akankwo's cousin, Amikwu, was passing by the church on his way from the neighboring village when he saw Nawoye among the Christians. He was greatly surprised, and when he got home, he went straight to Akankwo's hut and told him what he had seen. The women began to talk excitedly, but Akankwo sat unmoved. It was late afternoon before Nawoye returned. He went into the obi and saluted his father, but he did not answer. Nwoye turned round to walk into the inner compound, when his father, suddenly overcome with fury, sprang to his feet and gripped him by the neck. "'Where have you been?' he stammered. Nwoye struggled to free himself from the choking grip. "'Answer me!' roared Akakwo. "'Before I kill you!' He seized a heavy stick that lay on the dwarf wall and hit him two or three savage blows. "'Answer me!' he roared again. Nwoye stood looking at him and did not say a word. The women were screaming outside, afraid to go in. Leave that boy at once, said a voice in the outer compound. It was Akankwo's uncle, Uchindu. Are you mad? Akankwo did not answer, but he left hold of Nwoye, who walked away and never returned. He went back to the church and told Mr. Kiaga that he had decided to go to Umuafia, where the white missionary had set up a school to teach young Christians to read and write. Mr. Kiaga's joy was very great. Blessed is he who forsakes his father and his mother for my sake, he intoned. Those that hear my words are my father and my mother. Nwoye did not fully understand, but he was happy to leave his father. He would return later to his mother and his brothers and sisters and convert them to the new faith. So you see Nwoye's plan. I'll show you, Dad. You want to beat me? You want to treat me this way? I'll abandon your way of life, and I'll join this new way of life, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to convert everybody else too. 
As the Congo sat in his hut that night gazing into a long fire, he thought over the matter. A sudden fury rose within him, and he felt a strong desire to take up his machete, go to the church, and wipe out the entire vile and miscreant gang. But on further thought, he told himself that Nwoye was not worth fighting for. Why, he cried in his heart, should he, a Konkwo of all people, be cursed with such a son? He saw clearly in it the finger of his personal god or chi. For how else could he explain his great misfortune in exile, and now his despicable son's behavior? Now that he had time to think of it, his son's crime stood out in its stark enormity. To abandon the gods of one's fathers and go about with a lot of effeminate men, clucking like old hens, was the very depth of abomination. Suppose when he died all his male children decided to follow Nwoye's steps and abandon their ancestors. A Conquo felt a cold shudder run through him at the terrible prospect, like the prospect of annihilation. He saw himself and his fathers crowding round their ancestral shrine, waiting in vain for worship and sacrifice, and finding nothing but ashes of bygone days, and his children the while praying to the white man's God. If such a thing were ever to happen, he, a Conquo, would wipe them off the face of the earth. A conquo was popularly called the Roaring Flame. As he looked into the log fire, he recalled the name. He was a flaming fire. How then could he have begotten a son like Nwoye, degenerate and effeminate? Perhaps he was not his son. No, he could not be. His wife had played him false. He would teach her. But Nwoye resembled his grandfather, Unoka, who was a conquo's father. He pushed the thought out of his mind. He, a conquo, was called a flaming fire. How could he have begotten a woman for a son? At Nwoye's age, a conquo had already become famous throughout Umuafia for his wrestling and his fearlessness. He sighed heavily, and as if in sympathy, the smoldering log also sighed. And immediately a conquo's eyes were opened, and he saw the whole matter clearly. Living fire begets cold, impotent ash. He sighed again deeply. Um, Akako's nickname here, Roaring Flame, is very telling of him. See, a fire, it can be good, but it's also a very destructive force. Much like Akako is very destructive. And when fire goes out, it leaves nothing but these ashes, which are not very useful. And so that may be a metaphor for Akako's life, and he realizes that and is a little bit saddened by it. Let's look back at a couple of things in this chapter, because this chapter has a whole lot going on. They make several mistakes in my mind in this chapter, the Igbo people do. The first mistake is allowing them to build this church at all. They think that, oh, we'll give them some evil forest land and they won't want to build there. Uh, but that's not what happens at all, as we see. The missionaries build there and then they thrive there. And then their thriving there allows people to, to see, oh, there's something about this new religion that's more powerful than our ways of life. And so more and more people want to join this thing. So, they give them the evil force. That's mistake number one. The second mistake is that they think within four days these people are going to be dead. And then they are. And then instead of kicking them out, they go, nah, let's just wait and see what happens. Which is a mistake. The third mistake comes after the seventh week. When they say, no man is going to be able to live past the seventh week after angering our gods. But then these missionaries do. And then again, instead of taking up their machetes and driving these missionaries and their church out of their village, they say, uh, I think it's going to be all right. And then they allow this woman to join who has twins. So by accepting her, any other woman who's known to give birth to twins may think in her mind, ah, oh, they, accept, they accepted Ineka, so why don't I go and join them? And nobody really cares because they think that she's expendable. So this is another problem. And you're going to see more and more of these problems occurring. Because the Igbo people are, for whatever reason, they just don't take these missionaries very seriously. They don't see a very serious problem or a threat to their way of life here. They continue to kind of shrug it off and, ah, I think it's going to be all right. The other thing we need to talk about is the allegory. Now we talked at the beginning of this novel about it being a national allegory and how Conquo represents all of the Igbo people within this story. 
Yeah, and so when you have a conquo representing the old generation, the generation that still believes in the Igbo culture and their religion, you have his son, Nwoye, representing the younger generation or the new generation. And with Nwoye abandoning his father's way of life to join this new way of life, it's representative of uh, a shift in the dynamic in this culture, in the Igbo culture. <clears throat> where the new generation may be ready to abandon these old ways in favor of the new ones. And that can be very detrimental to their culture as well and their way of life. So chapter 17 was very rich. Uh, we'll see what chapter 18 has in store the next time.